pleasure and delight to be here with Elad Naharai, who is the writer behind the blog Pop Chassid, which you gotta check out. Check out the links below. The co-founder of the creative Jewish website and community, Hevraya, amazing group to check out. And one of the leaders of Torah Trump's Hate, a new Orthodox Jewish activist organization and community. Elad is at the intersection of tons of creative and religious and political and social and moral uh, intersections um, that are pressing and crucial for, uh, for young Jews and beyond. So thanks for taking time to talk. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So we share the interest of, um, and passion for Orthodox social justice activism. And um, I'd love to hear where that interest comes from for you, kind of what, what narrative that's connected to and values. Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, for better or for worse, I, uh, I, be, I became religious later, in, or orthodox would be a better way to put it, I became orthodox later in my life. And for a long time, I think what I really valued about that was the spiritual dimension of it. Um, I was so attracted to Hasidus and to Kabbalah, to spiritual ideas, and I really believed in the power of the human and in connecting with people beyond labels. Um, I really... I still actually really hold by that, but one of the things that happened was really the election, honestly, the election of Trump. I'm kind of like a typical, I think, although there's all this uh, religious uh, aspect to this, I, I also feel like I'm a very typical story in the sense that I was a little asleep before, at least politically speaking, before Trump became president. And Trump... Uh, running actually really woke me up even before even like during the primaries and watching it, w it was really my community that woke me up in, the, in a negative sense because I started to see how people that I really believed in and really valued and really looked up to were not just uh, supporting uh, someone like this but they were uh, kind of trumpeting him for lack of a better word and um and, and celebrating him, and it really disturbed me. It really, really bothered me. And I think that feeling of being disturbed caused me to speak out more about it. And then that created a backlash where I felt very alone because in the Orthodox community, even speaking up about this one, one topic yeah. is enough for a person to feel kind of cut out. Yeah. And then that led to me connecting. It really was a very communal experience. It led to me finding out about this Facebook group. Um, it's funny because we tend to downplay the power of this stuff. It's actually incredibly powerful. Um, I found this Facebook group called Torah Trump's Day. I was actually invited by the founder who was trying to find other Orthodox Jews who had felt alone. This was actually a phenomenon. Um, so many Orthodox Jews were feeling alone because of this election. Um, and it's a crazy to think that, po and I think that's when I understood that politics is so much deeper than I thought it was. Because if enough, if so many people feel not just yeah. upset, but alone, mm -hmm. because they don't share the politics of the people in their community, yeah. there's something very powerful about that. Right. And so that was kind of really what started me on the road, along with these other people in Torah Trump's Hate, yeah. which is the organization, um, to start to really think of myself as someone who cares about social justice. Right, right, very powerful. So what do you think... Uh, the Jewish world looks out at orthodoxy and is kind of astonished at the levels of support for the administration that we see today. And I think they're really grappling to understand those dynamics, um, given our history and our values. So I wonder, what, what do you see as some of the dominant values that inform the orthodox political worldview? Either to what degree do you think it's Torah-based or theologically based, to what degree is it just sociological for other factors? How do you understand what's happening there? You know, so it's interesting. Um, I'm a Balshuva, which means you know I became Orthodox later in life, and you are as well. And um, one of the things that I've noticed is that Balshuva have been the ones that I've seen the most shocked and the most uh, feeling alone after the election. Now, obviously, not all of them. Um, and I think to me that's an indicator that this is not a theological issue. Mm -hmm. This is a sociological one. It's one where two uh, distinct groups of Jews have found different ways of, of finding their place in the diaspora, and specifically in America. Um, obviously, you know, the ones who are looking at the Orthodox Jews are 
confused and flabbergasted. And I would argue that, um, unfortunately, the Orthodox world also looks at the uh, group of Jews who are looking at them, uh, not necessarily in a similar sense, but at least in a very uh, critical sense as well. And one of the things that I discovered is that we're both dealing with how do we navigate this world that we're, we're, both, we're really scared of and we're really confused by. And it's funny because ironically, as much as I've kind of railed about orthodoxy and the orthodox world's relationship with Trump, on the other hand, this has forced me to face some of these questions. Like, why, why did this happen? How could this happen? Um, because to me, it seems so antithetical to anything Jewish, theologically speaking, and also sociologically speaking. Like, how could orthodox Jews support an authoritarian? And I actually think that um, because I came through Chabad, which is a Hasidic movement, um, I learned quite a bit about how there's a different relationship and a different view of political power in the mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. uh, that the Orthodox world has, mm -hmm. and especially the Haredi and the Hasidic world. Um, if, I'll give you an example. Um, when you go to a Fabrengan, when you go to a, a spiritual gathering mm -hmm. of Hasidic Jews, there are so many stories about authoritarians but not necessarily, they are critical of the authoritarians. They don't see them as good people. On the other hand, their goal is not to destroy the authoritarian. Their goal is to, how can we navigate a world in which there are always going to be evil people running the world? Mm -hmm. And one more example is that the altar Rebbe, the first Rebbe of Chabad, actually didn't want Napoleon to win the war mm -hmm. against uh, Russia. Why? Because he actually thought the assimilation would be a bigger problem because uh, Napoleon had promised that Jews would have uh, religious freedom if he invaded, and if he won. And so the first Rebbe of Chabad actually didn't want that. He actually wanted more oppressive, a more oppressive society because he felt that's the best way for us to preserve our Judaism. Mm. And in an interesting way, you could actually argue that he was right because we're now dealing with this issue of, of assimilation. And I think that this is something that um, for other Jews it's hard to understand and grapple with, but ultimately the way of life of Judaism is far more important to preserve than some of the things we've kind of consecrated as liberal Jews, mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. in my opinion, for better. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it's just, they have other priorities and I think it's something that we need to grapple with honestly and not just as much as it's wrong, I think so much of it is wrong, I think we have to grapple with it in a way that goes beyond uh, labels. Yeah, you know? yeah. I wonder also, going to the, to the Baal Kiva component, um, if some of this is about exposure. Um, having grown up with friends and family members who were uh, Gentile or people of color, um, a, a, whole, a whole array of diversity that I was comfortable in, which I in no way viewed as hostile. Um, that exposure gave an empathy as you know towards the common decency and humanity, which if you grow up in an ultra orthodox world, you're unlikely to experience. I remember when, even living in Washington Heights, um, there were two types of people living in Washington Heights. There were modern Orthodox Jews um, and Dominicans, and they didn't talk to each other. They totally didn't talk to each other. You know, one of the theory, and I'm curious if it resonates for you that I've heard, is that pretty much the ultra-Orthodox and centrist Orthodox vote, as distinguished from modern Orthodox and progressive Orthodox, the centrist and ultra-Orthodox votes are more or less aligned with evangelical Americans. Mm -hmm. And part of that was they looked out at the country and said, religion is under attack. What does it mean to be a religious American? And they looked at evangelicals and said, that's a religious American. So let's kind of vote for these policies, which Torah has really no view on or no way would you really learn Torah and come out with a certain view. You know, you, you, you looked just recently at this whole Ben Shapiro thing of sort of a, 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 an adamant pro-life position, whereas Judaism is, not, in my view, neither pro-life nor pro-choice. It's incredibly complex um, in terms of navigating those positions that all of a sudden evangelicals say that. So if I want to be a religious Orthodox American, I'm going to, you know, vote. So I wonder if you see, if you see this happening also. Yeah, I actually think, I mean, it's something that has been brought up by others, so I'm not uh, the originator of this yeah, idea, yeah. but um, I think we talk constantly about assimilation liberal assimilation right, to right, right. the secular world. Yeah. What we don't realize is happening is an yeah. ideological assimil assimilation. Right, right. Right. Um, the di it's really, ju I mean, it's fascinating, actually, because so much of it is connected to this, this uh, you know, the nationalism of, even, of evangelicals, and, yeah. and then this idea that actually what they're trying to do, and what nationalism tries to do, what ethno-nationalism tries to do, is create borders, right? It's very much about... Uh, 
building an identity within a, a structure. And so evangelicals in many ways share that with, they, they share that specific thing with Jews. The problem is that because of that, uh, I'm sorry, with Orthodox Jews, yeah. because of that, um, Orthodox Jews have so thrown in their, and, uh, their energy and their commitment to the evangelical world that it's just like anything, the more that you associate with a group, right. the harder it is to distinguish your beliefs from theirs. Yeah, right. And right. especially if they're the dominant one, it's very hard. Yeah. And then it's the same, it's the same dynamics that happen with any kind of assimilation. Yeah. I just think we don't talk about it enough. I, I wonder to what degree you've experienced any backlash. I, um, <laughs> uh, as someone who is very, vo myself, someone very vocal about progressive Jewish values yeah. within orthodoxy, I could write a book about sort of the, about the kind of uh, attacks, um, uh, civil and very uncivil I've received. And I, I wonder what your experience has been with that also. Yeah, wow. Um, it's funny, I laughed just because of course, yeah. Of yeah, course there's right. been a backlash. Right. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, it's two, a year before I started speaking out against Trump, and this was before I considered myself even political, I right. just wrote one article against Trump. I had start. I had run a campaign, uh, a crowdfunding campaign, to do a full page ad in the New York Times yeah. to criticize them for the way that they were covering the stabbings in Israel. Yeah. And because of that, I had built up, uh, among other reasons, I had built up this audience of very pro Israel, very pro Orthodox Jews, whether they are Orthodox or just pro Orthodox. Um, and so the moment that I spoke out, it was incredible to me to see the backlash. Yeah. Not only that, but also that I lived, I live in Crown Heights, yeah. and for a long time I identified as like 100% Chabad, and over there as well, I felt quite, quite, quite a bit of backlash. Um, a lot of, it's kind of hard to even talk about in the, because it's hard to describe the level of animosity yeah. uh, that you get. Right. Um, and I think it's even harder because now if people look at me, uh, and they look at my, uh, I, I kind of see myself as a, no matter what, we're always displaying a character right. when we're online, or right. when we're writing. Um, I see that. And then, and um, so when people see that character now, they see a person who's much more combative than yeah. he used to be. I used to be very much speaking about uniting people and these sorts of things. And um, so I think it's hard for people to understand that a lot of that has been shaped mm -hmm. by that backlash. Right, right. Um, and I don't mean that in a way of, uh, like just reactively, it w it's more of a realization that this backlash exists for a reason. I don't think it's just emotional. Mm -hmm. I think that to a certain extent it's structural. That I've, I've experienced this, um, this a few times where, especially once a leader speaks out against you, um, all of a sudden it seems to give validation to a group of people to, to really go after you. I've had friends yeah. who all of a sudden will turn on right. me right. in a way that I, I never expected. Right. And, and I think it has a lot to do with that aspect of things. Yeah. And so my, my point being that I've discovered that, um, yes, I've gotten a backlash. Um, and I think that the answer to that backlash is not, I think, you know, there's a dynamic now in America where we're being told that we need to be, I think the word is civility. We need to have more civility when it comes to people we disagree with. And unity. Which, Right, and unity, we hear these words a lot, which are, of course, important values. Yeah. I would argue that what's happening, that what happens in the Orthodox world is a microcosm of that in the sense that we are told constantly that we are dividers yeah. when we have a different opinion right. and when we speak out strongly about right. it. Um, and I think what I've, I've learned is that the only way to really address that is not by pretending, not by giving into that narrative. Like we have to embrace whatever they think of us, they'll think of us. But ultimately the reaction that we get from people has nothing to really do with whether we're doing the work right or wrong. Mm -hmm. That's up to us to figure out. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, totally, totally. It could go on for a while. It though. used to be in, in the Haredi world that the threat was reform Jews, conservative Jews, secular Jews, right. but now the whole war is really against those sort of progressive Orthodox Jews who kind of expose hypocrisies or injustices right. um, from the inside, and that touches a nerve so deep, which I think you I think you reflected on very powerfully. So, b moving from the painful and the dark side, where I know so many um, um, young progressive Orthodox Jews like us. 
are really struggling with their worldview and loneliness and, 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 and the like. And you, you are creating wonderful community to engage them. Mm. Um, to the positive, my, um, my first positive question is, how does Hasidus inform and support um, your leadership work, your community building work? How does your sense of deep religious spirituality, uh, maybe even one example, um, add insight to this battle for the soul of America, for the soul of democracy, really? That's a great question. It's funny because I'm like, um, I'm uh, not sure if it's always, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was still recording. Yeah, still good, still good. Um, so I'm actually kind of, it's funny, for a while I had a fraught relationship with Basidus after this, uh, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. But what's interesting is that since then, um, I think actually once I made the decision to really double down on who I am, um, Hasidus has actually become this great comfort because I think the power of Hasidus is its ability to speak. I really believe that its power is so universal and it's so deep and it goes to a place that is not just about, uh, it's really, I mean, there are aspects in terms of how it's taught and in terms of the details that are tribal, but for the most part, Hasidus and, and mysticism and Kabbalah, like these, these are concepts that go beyond the topics that we, uh, that we speak about. And I think part of the reason that it was hard for me at first was because I couldn't, because of the way it was taught to me uh, from some people, not from everyone, but from some people, was that it was, it was taught in a very uh, tribal way. Once I understood that concepts um, could be expanded to the right. universal, right. The, the idea of like um, the power of that we are a piece of God and that God is literally within us um, is something that unfortunately is taught in a very tribal way but is actually right. so true for anyone and, and the only way we can re and that, I know that's also a, a generally Jewish moving topic. from Pintalayid to Tselem Elohim things like that right know, I mean like, these are right these are also general Jewish topics yeah. but it's interesting because uh, Hasidus really emphasizes this quite a bit and it also emphasizes how when you are able to focus on that you're able to break apart a lot of the physicality that surrounds your disagreements and or the any other struggles you're having so um, and it also teaches it also teaches for example how to disagree because if you disagree with someone so strongly and you think there's something they're doing is really like truly like at least is leading people not the question is then is that person evil how do I deal with that person who did something I think is so wrong mm -hmm. especially someone that I consider to be part right. of my community right. or my friend right right and I think Hasidus has a beautiful answer to this which is that the part that you disagree with is like is the physical and the part yeah. that is is beyond that is is the true person, yeah. Yeah. and so we have to keep kind of digging for that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, and to go to this realm of panentheism, that divinity is within everything. Um, I think back to this uh, YouTube about the Rebbe davening through his tender, mm. right? This notion that what we're fighting for is um, the, the the very fight, the very obstacle itself has divinity within it, and everything involved in it. Um, has this unity, interconnectedness. So that, that's awesome what you're saying here about the physical versus the spiritual and being able to see past that. I would, I would say yeah. one more thing. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah, okay. please, yeah. Um, so it was actually interesting because I had just thought of something that really actually gave me a lot of peace, which was that I was always struggling with like this idea is politics, like politics just felt so non-religious to me. It felt yeah. so like, right. how can you find right. any spirituality? Right. Totally. Like, you know? Yeah. And it was fascinating to me because I had, I had been taught for so long, because I'm, I'm a writer, and I believe very much in creativity, and I run a creative organization and stuff, and I had been taught from the very beginning that, uh, I, by Hasidic teachers that, that God is in everything, right? Just like you're describing, and I think that's why it sparked yeah. it in me. Yeah. It's in literally everything. And actually, the things that seem the lowest, yeah. the Kabbalah teaches that the things that are like the most physical things yeah. are actually the things that have the highest sparks mm -hmm. because they fell, mm -hmm. they fell the furthest, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. so politics actually has incredible right. power to transform the right. world in a spiritual way. Right. And it blows my mind, actually, yeah. that the very people that teach this, I feel like, don't, 
seem to understand that. Yeah, right. So, yeah. yeah, totally. And I think there's this idea that like Torah Lishma is separate from a political realm, yeah. as opposed to like the entire Torah is political, right? I mean, every, right. every exactly. language choice is a political move. Right. And to pretend like you can exist in an apolitical realm yeah. only brings you to shtika kahoda, right? That silence is complicity. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to learn Torah. Right. That itself, number one, the Torah is political. Number two, the silence is political. Right. So, okay, so I think I'm moving to our last issue is what do we do now? <laughs> um, can we transform orthodoxy from the inside, from within the establishments and the infrastructure? Um, or does this require building alternative uh, spaces? outside of those establishments. And, and if it's the latter, um, what does that look like? This is a question I struggled with for a long time. Um, and I know many of my friends are struggling with because I have a lot of friends that are in different uh, organized Orthodox communities and they really, really, it's hard for them because it's very personal. Like, it's very personal to say, the question sounds structural, but actually the question is very personal right. because if someone grew up, especially if someone right. grew up in a community, right. It's very hard for them to think, I'm going to, is, is really the only option for me to go and build something else right. or join something else? Like, I really just want to reform where I am. Um, now, I think the question is impossible to answer completely, but I will give you my own personal yeah. experience. Yeah. Personally, I have felt like because we look at the Orthodox world as monolithic, we've created a monolithic Orthodox world. Meaning to say that we think that there's something inherently wrong with building something new. <coughs> because it means that we're, people look at that as abandoning. I hear this quite a bit myself. As aban you're abandoning your community. You're abandoning your place in there. And, and, and these are people that, that care and believe in you is actually uh, part of the difficulty of it. Because they look at you and they're like, if you stayed here and you tried to really you know, adapt yourself uh, in order to make it work, then you could make a huge difference. And maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Um, what I do know is that number one, for me at least, it would be incredibly unhealthy. And I know for most of the people that I see trying to stick it out, especially the ones that deeply have problems with their communities, um, I see how unhealthy it is for them. Right. So on, on a pure, purely uh, health-based level, I would argue that, especially if someone's feeling it very strongly, like you and me do, and like I know so many other people do, I think it's important that we start to think outside the box, start to think about what we can build, because really the only way that, the, the important thing to, to realize is that if we're building something new, or we join something new, or we you know, move somewhere new, or whatever it happens to be, it can sound dramatic, but the truth is it might be necessary, um, that the more we do that, the more we're actually investing in those communities. Why? Because the more that we create alternatives, and the more that we create uh, um, communities that reflect our values right. as opposed to constantly working against people that have so much more power right. and influence right. in this than right. us, then the, the more that we can really make a difference in, right. in those communities, not just in our own. Right, that's yeah. very powerful. And I, that, 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 that last point is really crucial too. That those in the establishment who should not merely view this as subversive and God forbid destructive, but understand how important this is towards giving a religious spaces to those who need it and how that's ultimately going to strengthen the structure in the end. I really believe that, ultimately. You answered that very eloquently, and I, and I, think, um, um, I think that the importance, uh, religiously, of not just resisting, but having joyful, simchadix, religious spaces, right. um, where we don't feel like in our religious, spiritual space, we need to be in a process of resistance. Right? It's so crucial to our health. And here I wanted to speak to the Hever for a moment about this important uh, point that Elad said around health, which is um, sometimes, however, we have to break out if we're in unhealthy spaces. Um, domestic violence, child abuse, God forbid, obvious cases, but also cases where we're suffering with from mental illness from spaces that are perpetuated from uh, pro very problematic dynamics around us. We can remain religious Jews and break from infrastructures that are, are causing us deep pain and are being destructive to our souls. So um, make sure to check out Elad's awesome work. Follow him on Pop Chassid, amazing stuff. Follow him on The Forward and Haaretz and Guardian all over the place. And follow Torah Trump's Hate and the leadership they're doing. Check out Chavraya, invest in Chavraya, the website, the community, training leaders and fostering creativity. And yashkach to you and chazak baruch, continue the amazing work. Thank you so much.